Hey, and thanks for clicking in. This is the Uproar Live YouTube channel, and we are so glad that you are here today. But before we get into this amazing message, go ahead and click that subscribe button. We have new videos for you every single week. We also have so many ways that you can connect with us. Go ahead and visit our description to learn more about it. And you can also sow into our ministry by using one of our six ways to give. Here at Uproar, we make giving easy. Mm -hmm. And your giving goes towards our many outreaches that we conduct all year long. So we want to thank you for partnering with us. Now, let's check it out. How many have ever been in a place where people were so in love, it made you uncomfortable? Yeah. I remember one time I was on a four hour flight coming back from Dallas and I'm sitting by the window and this guy and this woman, the whole flight were just making out the whole time. I mean, I was so uncomfortable, like they kept bumping into me and stuff and like they, they weren't doing anything too weird. They were just kissing and like super clingy and I wanted to look at them and say, can y'all just please get a room? You know, and there's moments like that where you see people, and I, I love love. I think love brings just a fresh energy to a room. There's nothing like fresh love. I'd rather people be in love than be grieving at a funeral. You know, times of happiness are really hard to find. And when you see people that are freshly in love, it brings a fresh energy to the room. But sadly, 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 you know, I'm the type of person that will tell people the truth if I see red flags. And people that are really in love don't want to hear truth in the moment because they're so caught in the moment that they really can't see everything that everybody on the outside is seeing. You know, like mom and dad are like, I don't know. I would wait a little bit, you know. You know, they can see things on the outside that you really can't see while, while you're... You're caught up in it. And, and I, I'm the kind of person that if I see something, I'll give God time to work on it and let the love phase out. But then eventually I'm going to have to tell you the truth. And I remember one time I was talking to a friend of mine who got into a relationship and, you know, he's posting about it. He's excited about it. And, you know, I just sat back and watched for a little bit. I didn't know her yet. So I was like, you know, let me just feel it out and get in the room with him and Within 10 minutes, I knew this is not the person for you. The reason I knew it is because every time we were off in the corner talking and I would just glance over to see what she was doing because it was only a handful of us in the room. Every time I looked over to see her, all I saw was her looking back at us creepily <laughs> as if I was going to kidnap my friend or something. And I knew right away, I was like, dude, you do not have the capacity for her. It doesn't make her bad. It's just that when people, I used, like to use the word clingy. When, when people are clingy, they, 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 they tend to require a lot. I'm a builder. I'm a mover. So, you know, I can do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But, you know, I can't give like everything 24 hours a day, every moment I'm awake. No, I'm too busy for that. But, but clingy people require a lot of attention. And when the passion goes off and the passion goes away, you have to answer this question. Do I have the capacity to love you forever? And, and that's a hard question to answer. Do I have the capacity to give you what you need till death do us part? I remember one time I was freshly in church and my girlfriend used to like to walk down to the altar with me. And, you know, literally it got to a point where it was so uncomfortable in church. And I was standing at the altar and see, when I'm at the altar, I'm really having a moment with God. I don't want nobody rubbing my shoulder, rubbing my back. Like, you're distracting me. I'm trying to hear from the Lord. And every time you touch me, I'm thinking about you. And I don't know if you've ever seen that, 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 that video or that gif where President Trump was trying to like rub the Pope's hand. 
and the Pope like slapped his hand away. That, that's literally what I did. I know, it's kind of weird, ain't it? That's literally how I felt when this was happening, and, and it never happened again. But I didn't like the clinginess. It bothered me because the Bible says this, work out your own salvation with trembling and fear. See, a lot of people get thrown off in their faith because you bring too many people to your faith with you. Faith is personal. You know, God makes promises to people. He doesn't make the promise to the family. He makes the problem to the, the promise to the person. And if the person gets right, then the family will follow. But he doesn't make promises to groups. He makes promises all through the script. Abraham, I will make your seed great. Isaac, I will make your seed great. Jacob, I will make your seed great. David, the kings of the future will come from your lineage, from your house. God blesses people. And what happens is, if you don't realize this, when people fall off, you tend to quit too. Because you think that God messed up or that God didn't give a promise. But no, the promise was never to everyone. The promise was to you. So work out your own salvation, the Bible says, with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. See, often when people tend to be clingy, that's the word I'm going to use today, clingy, it actually stems from a deeply rooted problem. And it's usually abandonment or, or loss. And whenever these issues pop up, what happens is the person doesn't realize it but it is because of an issue that is deeply rooted. And whenever you don't deal with it, what happens is you get frustrated with people because they're not giving you what God was always supposed to give you. Nobody has the capacity to love everybody in this room. And when you treat people like they're supposed to, you rob God of, out of being who he is. Everybody has a limit. And if you don't have peace in God, you can push away some great people and some great opportunities, not because they're bad, but because you're, you're putting expectations on them that only God can meet. And so when a person is clingy, when a person has issues that are deeply rooted, that tie usually to abandonment in their life or loss, there's ways this leaks out. Red flags in a way. Number one. These people will not let arguments rest a bit. See, every argument is not to be resolved before you go to bed. There are some things you cannot resolve for months. So are you going to be miserable for months? There are some things you have to just give room to God, the Bible says. Give it over to the Lord. But when a person has abandonment issues, what happens is they'll, they'll block doors. They'll hide keys. They'll make threats. Because their fear is that if I don't resolve the problem, you may leave me like everybody else. And once again, this is a God moment because if they leave, they were never supposed to be with you. Amen. Amen. And if they stay, it will be because you prayed them back. But you have to be careful because it creates a dangerous scenario. Number two, there's a violation of boundaries. Every home should have a place at least for the, the children really don't get this luxury because sometimes you got to chase them into the bedroom to prove your point. But at least in the context of marriage, they're, they're supposed to be safe spaces in the house. 
There's supposed to be a room or a place that in the heat of the argument, if you can reach that zone, the person cannot follow. I like to call it for men, a man cave. You know, it's the place where if I can get to that line, everybody has to stop bothering me. And I can stay behind that line for two weeks. But if I come up into the kitchen for food, it's fair game. <laughs> it's a violation of boundaries. There has to be a place where when I get to that or you get to that place, all talk stops about the problem. Because if you don't have a safe place, then what happens is people create safe spaces outside the home. So my safe space becomes the bar. My safe space becomes the pool club. My safe space becomes the gym. And the problem is when a safe space starts to become anywhere outside the house, then it begins to change throughout time. And you want the safe space to be in the home. But when a person does not deal with these abandonment issues and these, these insecurities, what happens is nobody feels safe under the house. And so there becomes a violation of boundaries. Jesus said, foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests. The son of man has nowhere to lay his head. And when Samson didn't have nowhere to lay his head, you know where he laid it? Right in Delilah's lap. So there has to be a protection of, of boundaries. The next thing is this. There is a need for constant communication. I don't mean regularly like talking. That's, that's healthy. My mentor always says this. Any marriage that does not have pillow talk is already divorced and doesn't know it. Pillow talk is where you sit in the bed late at night and just talk about the day and talk about dreams and talk about the future and talk about things that are bothering you. That's, that's pillow talk. And a couple that does not have pillow talk is still married legally, but spiritually divorced. So I'm not talking about communication. I think there has to be healthy communication. But when a person is struggling with being clingy, they're FaceTiming you every 30 minutes. You know, you say, hey, I'm just going to the grocery store. They're calling you within 15 minutes. Hey, so uh, how long are you going to be? I just left the house. <laughs> but there is a constant need of communication. Once again, it's because I'm afraid that this may be the car ride that you don't come home. So there is a constant need of communication. The next thing is this. They challenge everyone and everything. Every person that comes into your life is a threat. They challenge everything. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? And I'm not talking about the type of challenge that's just trying to understand. It's the type of challenge that is actually challenging your heart. And so everything gets challenged. Everyone. I just don't trust her. You never even talk to her. How do you not trust her? I just, there's something about him. You've never even been in the same room as him. But it's deep. The next thing is this. They see separation as rejection. So anything that's done without me is rejection. And it brings pain. And it brings torment and it brings frustration because even if you go out to eat with the boys, it's separation. And this makes me feel rejected. And the reason this has to be dealt with and given to God is I call them the problems that come with it. When, when you struggle with this and it's not dealt with, you, you ultimately, you make bad relationship decisions because you're desperate. You're not looking at all the red flags and the flaws because you're desperate. I just want a man. I just want a woman. 
and you don't realize that you're not seeing correctly. So you make bad relationship decisions. You hold people back. Because as you walk with God, you're supposed to grow. And if you're with somebody, they're supposed to grow. But if you don't keep up in your growth, what happens is you try to pull people back to where you met them. And you're holding them back. Because the goal in life is to constantly keep moving forward. If I don't move forward, I might as well die. But when you don't deal with this, you can hold people back. You can push people away, good people that are really godly people, but you're putting expectations on them that they were never supposed to meet. And you're pushing them away. And you don't realize it, but before it's all said and done, you're going to push so many people away that you're old and just standing alone. You sabotage opportunities when you wrestle with this. Because God is going to send good moments into your life. But if you keep bringing your heart into head rooms, you're going to sabotage them. And when you struggle with this, you're not seeing clearly. So every room has your heart in it. When every room is not supposed to have your heart, it's supposed to have your head. When you sign the lease for your house, your heart has no room in that place. When you're signing a contract and hiring somebody, your heart has no room in that place. This is a head decision. This is what they deal with when they say, talk about EQ, emotional quote. It's, are you emotionally strong enough for the opportunities that are coming your way? So you got to deal with this. And lastly, you weaken your relationship with God. Because you keep putting things on people that God is supposed to be. You keep asking people to do things that God wants to do. And when you weaken your relationship with God, everything in your life has to fall apart. And there are multiple things that people can cling to. It's not just people. It could be pain. I see people cling to pain. Some people love to hurt because they've never seen their life without pain. And when I finally start to feel good, something's wrong. So I cling to pain. I, I cling to what happened to me as a child. I cling to what happened to me as a teenager. I cling to who left me in my 20s. I cling to the cancer that was found in my 30s. And you keep clinging and clinging and clinging. And God can't give you something fresh to say hello to because you won't say goodbye to what you're clinging on to from yesterday. So people cling to pain. People cling to their past. This is ultimately what got Solomon in trouble. Solomon, the Bible says, towards the end of his life, started sleeping around with strange women. Strange in the Bible, when you see that word strange women, it just means every, any woman that was not Hebrew. They were outsiders. And Solomon started dating, they say historically, he started dating women from Africa. And the reason he started dating women from Africa is because he was trying to recreate the experience he had with the Queen of Sheba. And he could never repeat it. He could never replace her. It was a moment in his life that was over. But look at how he's sabotaging his future, trying to recreate love from yesterday. And that's what a lot of people do. They try to recreate something. It can go all the way back to when they were 15. They're trying to still recreate it at 45. Not realizing that it is destroying their world because this person is supposed to be a new moment for you, but you keep trying to make them in to the old moment that destroyed you. I see it with church. People will come to uproar and say, my old church did this. 
then why'd you leave if you loved it? So what you're trying to tell me is you want us to be what you ran from. But this is what happens with religion. If we're not careful, we hold on to even religion and we, we stop keeping up with where God is going. And this is about to move forward very quickly. But in the book of Hebrews, it says this. It says, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go to perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead, and eternal life. The writer of Hebrews is saying, there's, there's a season that you got to move on from stuff. Because God is a God that keeps moving. You can't keep God still. He keeps moving. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. But, you know, his theology never changes, but his methods have completely changed. Well, no, they haven't, Pastor. Well, if his methods didn't change, then why do we have LED screens when they didn't even have projectors in the Bible? His methods keep changing. He's God. You cannot box him in. He's God. He, he has been moving since the beginning of time. He did it with Moses when he transferred over to Joshua. There was no more wilderness teachings. There was no more manna gathering. It was a new season. And when Moses did, did, died, God moved on to Joshua. When Eli got out of the will of God, you know what God did? He moved on to Samuel. When Saul started jacking up, God moved on to David. God will move on because he cannot be boxed in. That's why the worst thing to, or the worst type of person to follow is a person that loves to park. Because if you park on a moving God, you get left behind. So people try to hold on to religion. And ultimately, I've seen people try to hold on to even Jesus. And there's a term for these people. You're so heavenly minded that you know earthly good. Now, I do believe you could be so earthly minded that you know heavenly good. But God never intended for us to grab on to him and stay still. God always intended for us to keep up with where he was going. And where we left off last week was Jesus dealing with Thomas and going behind the closed doors and showing his wounds to Thomas and allowing Thomas to stretch forth and touch those wounds. And I talked last week about how everybody was in pain. We see the death, the burial, and the resurrection now as a good thing. We even call it, as I've been saying the last few weeks, we call it Good Friday. But it wasn't good for Jesus. It wasn't good for the disciples. It wasn't good for the women that followed him. It was horrifying. It was horrific to them. It was traumatizing to them. They gave up three and a half years of their life to follow this man. And they were in pain. And they felt abandoned. And they felt lost. And such was the case with Mary Magdalene. Now Mary Magdalene is an interesting character. Her and Jesus' relationship are, is one of those relationships that is very hard to understand. Movies have tried to tell the story wrong, like the Da Vinci Code. But, but they, they can't understand. It's a lot like David and Jonathan. How David said the love of Jonathan is better than that of a woman. And different groups try to say that David struggled with same-sex attraction. Because the thing about people is people cannot understand spiritual connections. So whenever there's a spiritual connection, people try to put a label on it. 
people try to figure it out. But not every relationship that is genuine has to be nasty. That's just where our minds go. And usually it's perverted minds that make sincere things perverted. Jesus and Mary's Magdalene, Magdalene, Magdalene's relationship was not sexual, but it was deep. Jesus found her in a low place. Jesus found her, most believe she is the woman that was caught up in adultery, that was thrown out by the mob to the feet of Jesus. Because the story is told right before Luke 8 and Luke 7. And after that story is told, now she pops on the scene as a follower of Jesus. But Jesus was the one who never turned his back on her, even when choosing her could have cost him his reputation. Jesus chose her. Jesus chose her when choosing her could have got him stoned. My favorite part in the story with the woman that was caught in adultery's house says, when all the people were gone, it was just her and saved Jesus. How many times in your life have all the people been gone and it's just been you and Jesus? All the people that said they would be there, all the people that said, till death do us part, all the people that said, I got your back, all the people that said, I'll always be a phone call away. It's funny how when you hit your lowest moment, they're nowhere to be found. People that you fed, people that you hugged, people that you sat up on the phone with till two in the morning and they're nowhere to be found at your lowest moment, but I'm glad they weren't there because it gave me and you a moment to find Jesus and to see how Jesus was always there. Jesus was always the call away. Jesus was there when everybody hated us. Jesus was there when they talked about us. Jesus was there when following us and being tied to us was not looking like a good decision. Isn't it good to know that in your lowest hours, in your lowest moments, Jesus will always be right there. It will always be you and save Jesus. Look at somebody and say, I just need Jesus. But it wasn't in Luke 8 that we see where Jesus got her. It says it came to pass afterwards that he went through every city and village preaching and showing glad things of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him and certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Jesus didn't have the good girls. Je Jesus has had the girls that the world would call crazy as a part of his team. Women that had evil spirits. Women that had infirmities, deeply rooted things going on inside of them. Jesus had Mary Magdalene, it says, out of whom, listen to this, went out seven devils. She was a mess when Jesus found her. And Joanna, the wife of Chusa, his name means prophet or seer, Chusa, Herod's servant, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. See, they were so grateful for how Jesus found them and what Jesus did in them that they said, it's only right that I minister back to you with what God has blessed me with. Amen. I've learned in life, you never have to beg people to be good to God that God has been good to. You never have to beg people to give to God, to sacrifice for the Lord who have really been changed by the Lord. See, the problem I find nowadays is people aren't really changed. They're not really delivered. They're not really walking away from struggles and sins and battling with them. No, 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 no. They just do what they want and sprinkle some Jesus on it. But God is always looking for some people that really want to change, that really want to get it together, that really want to be used, that really want to change the world, that really want to see God move through them, that really want to see God's healing power 
seen through them. God is always looking for people that say, Lord, if you changed me, you got everything tied to me in my life. It says they ministered to God of their substance because they were so grateful for what God did for them. Mary Magdalene was at the top and she would follow Jesus like Joanna would follow Jesus, like Susanna would follow Jesus because once Jesus got them, he got them. There was no more playing with it. They didn't give a Sunday here and a Saturday there. They gave their lives. I can always tell who has a calling on their life by how much of their life they give to God once he finds them. They threw it all down at Jesus. And Mary Magdalene would be there when he rode the donkey into town. And she would be there and see Zacchaeus climbing up the tree. And she would be there when blind Bartimaeus would be healed. And she would be there when the lame man at the pool would get up. She was there. And so when Jesus was taken from her, it was traumatizing. Because you, you must understand, nobody is born with seven spirits. No little girl says, when I get older, you know what my dream is? To be drugged out on a street and called an adulteress. You know what pushes a little girl to become that as a woman? Life and being mishandled. She didn't sign up for it. It's just a byproduct of being mishandled since she was a child. And Jesus was the first man to come into her life to not mishandle her. To actually care about her becoming a woman that people would talk about for thousands of years. And she had so much respect for Jesus. That when Jesus was taken from her unexpectedly in the garden, though he warned them multiple times that this was coming, it shook her. It shook her. Because what she imagined her whole life being now has been shattered. Have you ever been in something where everything you imagined of your future was shattered? I remember as a young man, I was engaged uh, as a youth pastor and everything was planned. A year of preparation. I mean, it was all put together. The church was involved. People were cooking things. People were planning things. Money had gone out. And a month before the wedding, she called it off. It put me on a spiral downward for about three years. Because my whole future was robbed. We were together for eight years. All through high school. And my whole future was rocked. We had the kids named. We said where we were going to live. And everything shattered. And I had to reimagine my future. And I never saw that coming. And having to reimagine your future is something that can make strong people do dumb things. So Mary has to reimagine her future. She comes from Magnola. Magnola is a small part of Galilee that was known for having all the women that were prostitutes. So she's probably wrestling with, what does my future look like? Am I going to end up how Jesus found me in the first place. She don't know what to do. But in John 20. She knows that. She has to get down. To the tomb. She has one assignment. In her mind. And that is to bring. The spices. To the sepulcher. Luke talks about this a little bit more in detail. It actually wasn't just her. It was a couple other women. 
But John really wants us to highlight Mary or wants to highlight Mary for a reason. But it, it, it says that it was the first day of the weekend. Multiple women went down and they brought spices and things with them. And they found the stone rolled away and looking in, the body was not there. The reason they were bringing stones down to the tomb is because they did not want the world to smell the stench of their dead leader. See, Having the heart of God means that the same way God covers people, I cover people. That's why you never hear me talk about when people fall. We got people that struggle, that are going through hard seasons, and they'll tell you in their testimonies down the road one day that, that in those seasons, we may have hid them somewhere in the church so that they could get their life together and still serve. But I really believe having the heart of God is not exposing the stench of people, but covering it. I'm not enabling it, but here's my rule. God, if you want to get this out, Get it out through somebody else, but it will not be me. That's my rule. Because guess what? You reap what you sow. And every person that lives lives of exposing others, there's a reason why everything you do gets exposed. So she's going down to try to make a stinky situation smell better. And we know who the other women were. It says in verse 10, it, it was Mary Magdalene, of course. It was Joanna. Remember, she was one of the ones that was delivered by Jesus too. Her husband worked in Herod's palace. And it was Mary, the mother of James. Not James the Great, but James the Lesser. God got a hold of her son. Look at these women. One woman was delivered of demons and sleeping around, Mary Magdalene. Joanna was a wife married to somebody who worked for Jesus or worked for Herod. And Joe, you know, and, and jo Mary, the mother of James, had her son who was invited to be upon Jesus' team. And most people believe Joanna's son was the sick boy that Jesus raised from the dead. All of these women are following Jesus and are there first thing in the morning because Jesus changed their worlds. And when somebody changes your world, you have to be there when it counts. So John wants to highlight Mary, probably because he sees how much Mary Magdalene loved Jesus. He's seen how dedicated she was. And out of all the women that went down, John 22 says she was the only one that ran when she saw the body wasn't there. She ran to get help. And I believe this is probably the primary reason John highlights her is because God always sees people that run for him. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain. Do you realize that there is a prize waiting for every one of us? Your prize is different than my prize. Your prize is your desire. Your prize is your dream. Your prize is the change. Your prize is the prayer you've been praying. God says the reason some don't get the prize is because some don't run. God is looking for people that run. This is not a standing season. This is not a sitting season. This is not a kneeling season. This is a running season for somebody. This is a season to run after every promise, run after your dream, run after your prayers, run after your purpose, run for your family, run for your career. This is a season to run. Look at somebody and say it's time to run. 
God looks for people that will run because the prize is not given to the turtles. The prize is given to those who have so much urgency for their tomorrow that they can't stay in bed today. So much urgency for their tomorrow that they won't let depression keep them down. So much urgency for tomorrow that a breakup will not cause me to stay in bed for a week. So much urgency for tomorrow that even if somebody dies, life's got to keep going on. So much urgency for tomorrow that if they take the car and they take the house, I'm going to keep on pressing because I know that if God gave me a promise, God cannot lie. Look at two people and say, it's time to run. Only one obtains the prize. So run. Paul told the church of Galatia, you did run so well. Who hindered you? Whenever you see a person start slowing down, it is always because of a person. Find the person, they'll pick up the speed. He says running or slowing down, that is, is never from God. I hear it all the past, I just need to take a break for a season. Slowing down is never for God. Because often people will slow down on God, but have you slowed down for your boss? Have you slowed down for your family? Everybody else gets a running version of you except the person who has the power to change your whole life. Mary took off running because she loved God and she was grateful for God. So she took off running. And she told Peter and John, they've taken his body. We don't know where it is. They've taken our Lord's body. And Peter and John run to the tomb. And they peek in like she did. But they go home. But Mary can't go home. It goes on to say, John 20. That they went in, they looked. Verse 10, they went to their homes. But look at what it says about Mary in our next slide. It says, But Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping. Weeping. She's just crying. Because God's been good to her. Her whole world is shattered. She's just crying. It doesn't say she's praying. She's just crying. Have you ever had a moment where all you could do was just cry? You couldn't even get the words out of your mouth. You were just crying. She's crying and she's stooping down to look into the sepulcher. The problem is she already knows the body's gone. She's crying and looking for something that she knows is gone to come back. How long are you going to keep looking for something you know is gone to come back? She's already looked in there once. Peter and John looked in there too and they amened her. But she's still looking. And crying. And this lets me know that whenever you cannot control your weeping, it's because you're looking for something or at something that is gone. She can't stop. And as she's weeping, she sees two angels sitting, one at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus was slain. And for those that have been coming on Wednesday, this is really to me. God showing Israel that you'll never find the Ark of the Covenant because Jesus was the Ark of the Covenant. The angel at the head and the angel at the feet. And she's trying to understand the situation. She sees the angels, but she's struggling still 
with the situation. It is possible to even see angels in a situation, but still struggle with it. And she says this in verse 13. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said, because they have taken away my Lord and I know not where they have laid him. Now, when I read this, I said, why are angels here? Are angels in the text to guard his body? No. So why are angels in the text? Why are angels at the tomb? Why is an angel sitting on the stone? Why are angels here? If, if this is not to guard the body or guard the tomb, why are they here? But when I went to Luke, I understood. When I went to Luke, it, it, it says that the angel said, why do you seek the living among the dead? Let me break this down. Why do you keep saying you want to live, but you keep looking for life in dead places? That's what he's saying. You keep going to the wrong places. You say you want life, but you're looking for life in the wrong places with the wrong people. He says, why are you looking for a living God in a dead place? I wonder today how many people are praying every day. Lord, I want to live. Lord, I want to live. Lord, I want to prosper. Lord, I want a good man. Lord, I want a good woman. Lord, I want good kids. But everything about your life says death. And could God be saying to you today, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. And here's the answer to why they're there. Remember. Look at somebody say, remember. Remember. Remember how he spoke unto you when he was yet in Galilee saying, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and crucified and on the third day rise again. Say, remember. The whole reason the angels were there was to get them to remember what Jesus said. God sent messengers just to tell them nothing grand. Remember, remember what he said to you. And whenever life is falling apart, sometimes you just need a reminder of everything God has said to you. A reminder of everything God has promised you. A reminder just to be reminded that God told me things were going to die but he also told me he's not the God of the dead. Just a reminder that it may end up in a tomb but on the third day it will rise again. I just need a reminder. I just need a reminder that my kids are going to be okay. I just need a reminder that God you have not forgotten about me in my sickness. I just needed a reminder that I'm not going to stay single forever. I just needed a reminder that I will have my first child. I just needed a reminder that this business will get off the ground. I just needed a reminder, Lord, that you got a plan for my marriage. I just need a reminder, God, that whatever is coming at me is not the period to my story. I just needed a a reminder. Is there anybody here that just needed a reminder that God has not forgotten about you? That every promise still stands? That God is working as we speak? That God is on the move even when you're stuck? Say, give me a reminder. All they needed was a reminder. All Mary needed was a reminder. And it says, and they remembered. You mean to tell me that God cares so much about my belief system that he will send a messenger just to remind me that he has not forgotten about me? Mary just needed a reminder, a reminder. And it says that while she was at the tomb, thinking she was talking to a gardener, 
and she was really talking to Jesus. See, the reason God needs you to get this reminder today is because until you understand what he has in store for your life, you're going to be looking at blessings and not seeing them. You could have something so valuable and not see it. You could have a really good man and not see it. You could have a really good woman and not see it. You could be at the job that God has aligned for you to be the CEO of. But because you don't like how they talk to you sometimes, you don't see it. Whenever you forget God's promises, you'll mistake Jesus for a gardener. And Jesus said, Mary, Mary. He said, before, why are you weeping? Why are you weeping? And I said this, the reason she's weeping is because she started stooping. And it wasn't that she was stooping and looking. It was that she was stooping and looking in dead places. Whenever you have to lower who you are, it is always an indication that you are with something dead. Because whatever God has for your life, is going to require you to stand up with all your strength. Yeah. She was looking in dead places. And, and when he said her name, he said her name. See, there's something about God saying your name. Mary. 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 And she turned and said, Rabboni. Which means my master, the person who has the keys to my destiny. And Jesus said, touch me not. You know, get off me. <laughs> now, I used to think this was because of something deep. That's how I read it. I think I may even heard it preach that way, that Jesus didn't want to be touched before he ascended. He could not be touched. But if he could not be touched, why did he tell Thomas to touch him? And Jesus was not opposed to people touching him. The girl with the issue of blood touched him. Jesus touched people. He touched people's eyes. He helped people up. Je Jesus was not the type of person that was phobic when it comes to being touched. But why is he telling her? The one who gave up so much. The, the one who he found on the ground. The one who he pulled seven devils out of. Why is he telling her, who arguably to me loves Jesus more than anybody? Because she's the one that's there first thing in the morning. Not when he's at his strength, but when he's at his death. Why is he saying, don't touch me? Well, I had to go a little deeper. And the message version really takes away all the work from digging. But the original Greek word here for touch is the same word that's used for cling or clinging. And what he's saying is, Mary, don't cling to me. Because you're clinging to me. And I've got to ascend. You're clinging to me, Mary. And you're holding me back. You're holding me back from going higher. You're holding me back from taking my crown. You're holding me back from sitting on my throne. You're holding me back from showing myself to hundreds of people in the next 40 days. Mary, you're, you're holding me back. I only got a little bit of time to do something major. And I have a feeling that that's where somebody here today is. There's something or someone that is holding you back. And you only got a little bit of time to do something major. They're holding you back from 
from your crown. They're holding you back from your throne. They're holding you back from becoming the woman God wants you to be, from becoming the man God wants you to be. They're holding you back from your healing. They're holding you back from your opportunities. And in this season, God is looking for about 50 people that have the courage to say, get off me, get off me, get off me, get off me. I can feel God taking me higher. You got to get off me. You got to get off me addiction. You got to get off of me pornography. You got to get off of me sex. You got to get off of me bad relationship. You got to get off of me toxic environments. I dare somebody to give God a praise and let them know this is the day where things got to start getting off of me. I need depression off of me. I need anxiety off of me. I need low self-esteem off of me. I got to get rid of this abandonment issue. I need it to get off of me because God is taking me higher. Say, get off me. Jesus says, Mary, get off me. And you got to have the courage to tell that thing, get off me. Get off me. Because God is taking me higher in this season. And I got some things I got to get done. And if I keep wasting time with you, I'm going to miss it. What is that thing that God is trying to get you to say, get off me to? That, that thing that causes you to choose bad relationships. That, that thing that causes you to hold people back. That thing that causes you to push good people away. That thing that causes you to sabotage opportunities. That, that thing that puts you into a spiral whenever separation happens because you feel rejected. What is that thing that has to get off of you so that people can see the highest version of who you are? He says, Mary, you got to get off of me because I need you to have a part in my story too. I, 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 I know how I found you and I know what you were caught up in. But, but Mary, see my boys ain't getting it. I need you to go tell the disciples I've risen. I'm going to my father. Go tell them you've seen the Lord. See, the reason I can't let you cling to me, Mary, is because I have a purpose and a story I need you to tell. And the problem with the scenario I gave is that the person that clings, yes, they're holding the other person back. But until they deal with that issue, they're actually holding themselves back because there is a story and a purpose that God wants you to tell and perform. So what is God saying today? Has to get off of you. Because the new level is already ready. But you'll never get to it with all of these things clinging to you and you clinging to all these things. Look at somebody again and say, get off me. Jesus loved Mary so much that he not only sent angels to tell her to remember, he loved her so much that he went personally to have a conversation with her. And the reason you're here today is because God loves you so much. He's trying to have a personal conversation with you today. And in his 40 days, what dawned on me last week is he has so much to do in a little bit of time. 
but he keeps making time for individuals that are hurting. And it shows me that at God's heart, he will never be too busy that he will not make time for somebody that's hurting. He's coming for the Mary that is hurting. He's coming for the person that has been abandoned. And this is not a women thing or a woman thing. I've seen dudes that are clingy too. <laughs> but this is not a, a sex thing. This is an abandonment thing. And until it's dealt with, you cannot move forward. What is the thing that you got to deal with? It can be as deeply rooted as something that happened to you as a kid, yes. It can be something that happened to you in your 20s, maybe a breakup, maybe a divorce. Maybe you cheated on somebody, maybe you were cheated on. Maybe you have a sickness, maybe you've had a sickness and you're afraid it's going to come back. Whatever that thing is, it's holding you back. And God is saying today, I want to have a personal conversation with you so that you can leave here feeling like you got something off of you.